afternoon, everyone. How is everyone today? We're great this afternoon. How are you, Dylan? Yeah, I'm, I'm not too bad. Nice. So, welcome to Let's Talk on Supernatural magazine. So, you've got Jonathan down here uh, near Portsmouth. We have Lara all the way up in Bonnie, Scotland. And Dylan in the middle, which is literally in the middle of the country as well. Uh, where are you at the moment, Dylan? I'm currently in beautiful Mid Wales. I'm at Bill Wells at the showground in my motorhome. I'm so actually... are we. We're, I just realised we're tri country. That's lovely. Yeah. It's the United Kingdom. From all parts of the rail, we just need someone from Northern Ireland to pop in and then we'll have the whole country covered. <laughs> so, how was everyone's week so far? Well, I know I always say it's hectic, but it's been an extraordinary week. I found that there's been a lot of stuff being sorted this week. All right, oh, that's things, good. Past, things, yeah, even to do with other people and somehow managing to get to witness that. How about you guys? Have, have you been the same or? Um, chores, gardening, silence. Covers. Do you see that, everybody? I asked. <laughs> oh, gardening. Gardening, yes, loads and loads of gardening. Oh my god, you were sorting stuff in the past, weren't you? Past clutter, uh, yes. <laughs> yeah. past, past clutter things. cupboards. <laughs> and Dylan, you said you were doing something in the garden as well. It sounds very exciting. Oh, my my wife has had me catching up on all the jobs that I've managed to get out of uh, in the last five years during lockdown. So uh, I've actually built a little bar in the garden. A uh, bar it's been in the garden. Fun. How cool it's is that? Fun. As well, and it's a it's a Ghostbusters themed bar, so I've called it the Ecto Bar. Um, I think we're going to need pictures. I, I have um, yeah, so I can was going to say, did, did you say barn? <laughs> bar, bar, as in drinks bar. I thought I heard right. Yeah, it's a bar, bar. <laughs> Quite ambitious if you built a barn in your own garden. It would have been. <laughs> right, so everyone, we this week we are talking about uh, haunted castles. and The whole Tri-Nations uh, have a, a fantastic combination of heritage in terms of enormous castles, anything from Norman up until probably the early Georgians is probably the last of the great castles being built, uh, but more as fortifications. So this week we are joined by... Dylan, who is going to tell us all about castles. Now, Dylan has quite a background. Um, PhD, Robert Gordon University, exploring the media representation of paranormal phenomena and research and its influences upon investigators of ghosts, hauntings and related phenomena. A retired police officer, wealth of experience in spontaneous cases for over 30 years. Um, but one of your fascinating, um, I got, I don't know if I should call it really a pastime, because it's much more than just a pastime, is your website, The Great British Ghost Tour, and you've branched out into America as well. So do you want to tell us about what that is about? Well, The Great British Ghost Tour started uh, in January 2010. Um, I was going through um, a period of, I was recovering from an injury when I was in the police. I had about three or four months off. So I thought, what am I going to do to pass the time? So I created this website because I've always had an interest in collecting stories from around the UK. So it, it just developed from there. Um, and then about two years ago, um, because I've always had this interest in how American ghost stories uh, relate or differ from our very own. So I thought it might be fun to start a great American ghost tour. So I've started that site off as well. So that's a, a growing collection of ghost stories from around the United States. Excellent. So um, we will be putting up links uh, to those websites if people want to go and have a look at those um, shortly. But let's get on with talking about haunted castles. So um, how do you want to do this? Do you want to do the countdown, 10 down to one? in terms of what you consider to be the most haunted castle. And we need to know, how do you go about classifying something as most haunted? Where does that evidence come from? Oh, that was a really wow. difficult one, because when you consider how many castles there are in the United Kingdom, that, that in itself is a phantasmical feat to try and clarify which one you think is going to be in the top 10. Um, originally, when I was doing this, um, I was doing a presentation out in the States. So I wanted to make sure that they were castles that if anybody actually wanted to visit, um, that they were iconic enough to be known. Um, and also that they had, you know, some good stories associated with them, um, lots of uh, lots of background, lots of folklore and history. So that was the main sort of thrust behind it. But when you're trying to whittle down from 
1,500 castles in England, 600 in Wales, and then about 2,000 in Scotland. It's, it's, it's quite a tough ask. I bet it. I, I totally agree. So let's start then with number 10. Which castle are we going to represent as number 10 on your list? Well, at number 10, according to English heritage, during the Dark Ages, Tintagel was an important stronghold and probably the residence of the rulers of Cornwall. Now, Richard, who was the Earl of Cornwall, built the castle here in the 1230s. And they suggest that the site was actually of no military value and legend alone seems to have inspired him to build it here. Now, Tintagel is, of course, shrouded in Arthurian legend. Gorlois, the King of Cornwall, sent his wife, Ugern, from Dimolo to Tintagel to save her from the lustful Uther Pendragon. However, Merlin allowed Pendragon to appear as Gorlois to seduce the poor woman. And it was from that act that Arthur was conceived. And it's Arthur's shade that is said to haunt the dark ruins of Tintagel Castle, whereas the ghost of Merlin himself is said to lurk in a cave below the castle that is named after him. Now, of interest, once a year, the castle is said to disappear, only to reappear in its former glory uh, before returning to its ruinous state that you see today. Or an apparition on the grandest of scales. Excellent. Um, so we're asking out there, has anyone ever visited Tintagel Castle? Have you had any experiences there? If so, let us know through the comments and uh, we'll talk about it. If you've had an experience at uh, any of the castles, uh, you've been up and down the country or any of the 10 that we've listed, either comment on our Facebook page on the supernaturalmagazine.com um, or come on and we can even chat with you live on the show. We'd love to hear from you. So let's do uh, number nine. Okay, moving on to number nine. I feel we should have some background music, you know, like the countdown on the charts. <laughs> yes, you should do. <laughs> okay, number nine. This one, it's a well, it's one that's actually closest to where I live. It's Bolsover Castle in Derbyshire. Now, it commands spectacular views over the county of Derbyshire, and it was designed literally to impress. William Peveril, who was one of William the Conqueror's knights, founded the castle in the late 11th century. However, it was neglected from the mid 14th century and its ruins provide the setting for the little castle, which was begun in 1612 by Sir Charles Cavendish, which is what you can see right now. It, it was a retreat from his uh, principal seat, which was at Welbeck, a few miles from there. Uh, and since 1984, the castle has been in the care of English heritage. But some say that the castle is still home to shades from its past. Some visitors have reported spectral smells of horses coming from the former riding school. Others claim to have been subjected to spiritual slaps. And a grey lady, which is seen walking through the grounds, has been spotted by a number of people. Sir Charles Cavendish himself is said to put in an appearance, wandering the corridors. But its most well-known story associated with the castle is actually also its most pitiful. And that's the apparition of a young woman, which has been reported in the kitchens of the castle. And she's been described as carrying a bundle under her arm and of being of a tearful disposition. And she makes her way towards the oven doors throws in the bundle that she was holding, upon which screams of an infant have been heard. Truly terrifying for those who wow. have thought in it. So that was Bolsover Castle. If you've ever visited, I know lots of paranormal groups go there and visit that location. So if you've ever been there, uh, do let us know, share your experiences. We would love to hear from you. We're going to start collecting these and posting these up on our Facebook page about various stories that people have experienced in, in all sorts of locations, not just castles. Uh, and we're going to see if we can do a top 10, not just of the castles, but locations up and down the country. So we want to hear from you if you've had any kind of experiences at all. So what would be our number eight? Uh, number eight is actually is one of my favourites, um, and it might well be Lara's. It's actually standing on its position on Castle Rock at the head of the old town. It's Edinburgh Castle, which is dominating the skyline 
of Scotland's capital city. Look at that, it's magnificent, isn't it? It really is. It is absolutely stunning. And I've visited it a couple of times, but uh, any excuse to go back to Edinburgh uh, and this will be top of the list for me. And there's been a royal castle on the rock since at least the reign of David I in the 12th century. And as one of the most important strongholds in Scotland, Edinburgh Castle was involved in many conflicts and 26 sieges in its 1,100 year old history which gives it a claim to being the most perceived place in Great Britain and one of the most attacked in the world. And it's also claimed to be one of the most haunted. So what have we got there? Well, we've, we've got a headless drummer, which was first seen shortly before Oliver Cromwell attacked the castle in 1650. And although many people have heard the sound of his drums coming from the battlements, his physical appearance is rare and is said to foretell danger to the castle. And a phantom piper has also been reported. Edinburgh Castle has a number of secret tunnels leading to the Royal Mile. When these tunnels were first discovered, an unfortunate piper was sent down to explore them. And the idea behind this was that he would play the pipes as he went along so that his progress could be tracked from up above. And everything was going well until the pipes suddenly stopped. When a rescue party went down to investigate, the piper had vanished and was never seen again. But they do say that his music can still sometimes be heard from the castle. Other occurrences revolve around French prisoners from the Seven Years' War and colonial prisoners from the American Revolutionary War said to haunt the dark and dank dungeons. And also the ghost of a dog has been reported wandering in the grounds very own dog cemetery. Other phenomena reported at the castle include sudden and unexplained temperature drops, disembodied voices and footsteps, and an unseen entity that tugs on clothes and hair of guests. So Edinburgh Castle, I say, certainly not for the faint-hearted. Mm. It's um, not. Yes. At all. It's, it's a gorgeous, and the, the, the ambience, if I want to call it, you've got to feel the energy there, haven't you, Dylan? It's quite incredible. Yeah, yeah, it is a beautiful castle. And lots of different time periods, that's what I found fascinating about it, is, is that very often you get a castle, uh, like Dover's quite captured, apart from then you've got the Georgian editions, whereas uh, Edinburgh has really old parts, and then and then you can see the development over a sort of like four or five hundred year pits of, architectural history it's quite a fascinating location to see uh, such yeah. a variety so if you've ever been to edinburgh do let us know in fact donna cadwell is commenting at the moment that she's one of her favorite places um so if you've got experiences do um post up because we'd be uh, collecting them and we'd love to hear from you or if you want to come and talk about any of these castles uh, do come on and we'll talk to you yeah, yeah. So there's many kind of close isn't there in edinburgh and even though it's not a castle have you been there dylan Sorry, you broke up then, just I didn't catch. It's because it's raining here. I think it's our reception. The ma <laughs> Mary Queen's Close. Have you been there? What I have. Um, I was last in Edinburgh about two years ago, and I did do a tour of Mary King's Close, which is a fascinating place to visit. Absolutely, absolutely. I, I got the, um, I had the privilege of doing an event in, I think it was actually, um, there's a Mason's Lodge, actually, you don't know it's there, but just at the entrance of Mary King's Close. And I was working in there and there was some very strange activity, very strange indeed. Fabulous, again, fabulous ambience that you could only actually, we can't do justice explaining it, you need to go for yourself. Yeah, you could, you could cheerfully spend about, three or four days just exploring some of these locations around the royal mile they are they are outstanding yeah i've i've stayed i was lucky enough to when i got married up in edinburgh i stayed at the witchery wow amazing place the history oh there. My God, you're yeah, so lucky. yeah really great very exciting place yeah um, so what is our number seven well we're gonna travel a fair distance from edinburgh all the way down to somerset and at number seven is Dunster Castle. So it's a former Mott and Bailey Castle, uh, which is now actually a country house, and it lies on the top of a steep hill called the Tor. Uh, it's been fortified since the late Anglo-Saxon period, 
And after the Norman conquest of England in the 11th century, uh, William de Mone constructed a timber castle on the site as part of the pacification of Somerset. At the end of the 14th century, uh, the de Mohans sold the castle to the Luttrell family, who continued to occupy the property until the late 20th century. And in 1976, the Luttrell family gave Dunster Castle and most of its contents to the National Trust, who now operate it as a tourist attraction. It's a grade one listed building and a scheduled monument. Now, this castle is reputedly haunted by several apparitions. These include that of an old lady in 17th century clothing who frequents the corridors of the castle. A roundhead soldier haunts the leather room in the gatehouse. And there's another 17th century female uh, in, in clothing the same as the Grey Lady reported on one of the castle staircases, but they don't know whether it is the same one sighted in the corridors. Interestingly, the sounds of money clanking and clinking on nights of the full moon have also been reported, which some have connected with the Demoans because they used to make their own coins at Dunster. A man in green allegedly haunts the castle shop in the stable block and a mysterious green light has also been reported there. Now, staff and visitors have also reported that the building has a somewhat uncomfortable and even menacing atmosphere. And they've also reported stock sometimes falling inexplicably from the shelves. Now, when I visited uh, Dunster Castle a couple of years ago to, uh, to do a bit of filming, uh, to make a short little documentary to accompany uh, the story of this. Some things went missing from my wallet, but that was because Mrs. Jones got hold of it and decided to buy things out of the shop. Nothing paranormal at all. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what would you say then is our number six? Well, I had to include one from my country, Wales, and it is none other than Castell Cardiff, which is Cardiff Castle. And it's a medieval castle and a Victorian Gothic revival mansion. It, it is spectacular to look at. Obviously, what you've got there is the original Mott and Bailey Castle, which was built in the 11th century by Norman invaders, which actually sits on top of a 3rd century Roman fort. Now, William the Conqueror, or Robert Fitzhammond, uh, commissioned the castle. But in the mid 18th century, Cardiff Castle passed into the hands of the Marquises of Butte. And John Stuart, the first Marquis, employed none other than Capability Brown and Henry Holland to renovate the main range, turning it into a Georgian mansion. And they actually landscaped the castle grounds, demolishing many of the older medieval buildings and walls. And when the Marquis died in 1947, the castle was given to the city of Cardiff and today it's run as a tourist attraction. Now, again, like the castles before it, has a number of ghosts. And at Cardiff, it includes uh, an old fashioned coach and four horses that has been seen at the gateway to the castle and travels up to the main doors. And it's also been heard by people inside the castle. Other apparitions include the second Marquis of Butte and the apparition of a grey lady, a young woman in a long robe whose identity is yet unknown. And she has been sighted also outside the castle at the bridge where she turns and waves towards one of the towers. Other mysterious occurrences that take place at the castle include heavy doors in the main dining hall opening and closing on their own and lights switching on and off. I'd like to know how many locations report seeing um, a grey lady. That's a very good question. Sometimes a white lady, sometimes a dark lady, mm. but a white lady or grey lady. So Why many locations. That? Why is it always grey, white, dark? Do we ever have a like a, a purple lady or a yellow lady? Why is it always like grey or white? And also, or... white, why lady? There are a number of stories. Man, um, you? you never get a grey man. Yeah, it's 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 the lady. I mean, obviously, more fabric, more more cloth. Um, oh, Angela is actually saying that there is a green lady, Tulloch Castle, Scotland. Ooh, 
the Red Lady, so, another couple that we might be touching on a bit later on. Oh, oh right. Okay. I can't wait for that one. So yeah, there are associated with folklore as well, that certain apparitions appear, certain female apparitions appear in a certain colour and have a folkloric link to them. Uh, but if you do go to the Great British Ghost Tour website, there is, there, we ha I have sections on there. So you'll have black ladies, grey ladies, white ladies. Uh, and you can visit that. You can click lots of different places where you'll find each one of those. Fabulous. Wouldn't it be great if it was the same grey lady, but she just travels around a lot? That's right. Just packs her case and then moves to another one that she thinks she owns all the castles. That's right. That would be amazing. Could be Mary Queen of Busy. I mean, that's why sometimes you only see them like every once every hundred years, because she's got a lot of places to go to. <laughs> she's got a lot to get around. It's like the Queen, really, isn't it? You know, yeah. get sick of the place, we'll just go up to Balmoral, right? <laughs> Some time out from Cardiff Castle. <laughs> oh, and Angela's very good. Uh, she's a grey man of Ben... Oh, I'm not going to get that right. Macdu? Fa famous folklore in Inverness. Yes, Macdu. Macdui, isn't it? It's Macdui. We've... Uh, wow. My God, and Angela, Laura, which I remember get you on the show at some point. You look like you're a wealth of knowledge there. She knows all the colours. And, and Laura's got a picture of the green lady. So if you could send that picture in, uh, Laura, we'll share it with everyone. If, you, if you've got it, please do send it on Facebook I'm and we'll Laura. share it with everybody else. Laura's a medium from America, actually. She's um, travelling around the world and making an income all at the same time. So um, Laura's a wealth of knowledge in a lot of different areas. So fabulous. Excellent. So um, if you've had any experiences with castles or any location at all, do share on Facebook. Let us know your experiences um, and we would love to hear from you. So, Dylan, I think we're up to number five. We are number five. We're going to go to another spectacular part of England and this time Cumbria to visit Muncaster Castle. Now, for over 500 years, Muncaster Castle was said to be, was the home of the Penningtons, and their fortunes were protected by something called the luck of Muncaster. And this is a talisman in the form of a six-inch diameter clear green glass bowl decorated with colours of gold, purple and white, and, and there's a verse relating to that legend. But it's the ghosts that I'm more interested in, and there are apparently at least five of them reputedly haunting Muncaster. These include Henry VI, an apprentice carpenter, a jester, a vengeful ghost in white, and that of a lion. You don't find many ghost lions in Britain. So first of all, Henry VI was sheltered at Muncaster following his defeat at the Battle of Hexham and is now said to frequent the castle. An apprentice carpenter was decapitated while sleeping in the old stable block and a heinous crime was committed by a jester named Thomas Skelton, who was nicknamed Tom the Fool. Now, Tom received such orders from Sir Ferdinand Pennington because the carpenter was having a love affair with Pennington's daughter. Now, Skelton's an interesting character. He was a jester at Muncaster at the end of the 16th century, reputedly one of the last court jesters in English history. Apparently a friend of William Shakespeare, he was a dark character responsible for a number of deaths during his time at Muncaster. He had quite a sick sense of humour, apparently, and this was highlighted when it alleged that if anyone asked him for directions to Ravenglass nearby, if he disliked the look of you, he would send you towards the hidden quicksand near the River Esk. And some of these people were obviously never seen again. Now, Tom died around 1600, According to legend, in the very marshes where he'd spent so many, uh, where he'd sent so many to their deaths when trying to return to the castle while he was drunk. Now his portrait hangs in the castle, and it contains his will. Witnesses have reported hearing footsteps approaching where his portrait hangs, and his ghost has been reported as that or has that as of another one by the name of Mary Bragg. Well, she was a foul-mouthed local girl who was murdered by being hanged from the main gate by drunken youths in the 19th century. Apparently they kidnapped her for a joke, but this joke went disastrously wrong. Those responsible were never brought to justice, which is the reason why she is dead to haunt the area. But finally, the lion. Quite an intriguing ghost, if ever there was one. Now, apparently the lion was shot by the last Lord Muncaster in Kenya and its skull is kept at the castle. 
And this lion has sometimes been heard prowling and growling around the castle as darkness falls. I'm not sure I'd want to be hanging around there at that time of the day. If that is the um, that, ooh, that sounds that sounds like somewhere I need to go and visit. I've not been that part of the country, and that definitely, I think, is now going to be on my list of places to go and visit. Um, so if you want any more information about what Dylan has been doing, I'll put a link on to uh, greatbushjoestour.co.uk. Um, have a look at all the different categories. See a Ghostbusters tour. Don't forget, Dylan, we still want the picture of the bar. It's in your garden, the oh, Ghostbusters, oh, yeah. Ghostbusters yeah. style bar. I think we need to see that one. I'll get that to you. So, um, what would be your number five, uh, number four location in the top ten of haunted castles in Britain? Well, we're going to head back to Lara Wells country. Mm. Is it? Is it? Is it Sterling? Nope. No, nope. I'll put you out of your misery. It's Glam's Castle. Oh, okay then. Yep. Yeah. Wow, look um, at that. This is just striking to look at. Um, it's the home of the Earl and Countess of Strathmore and Kinghorn, and it's been the home of the Lion family since the 14th century. Through the present building dates largely that we see today from the 17th century. Now, Glam's, if you didn't know, was the childhood home of Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother wife of King George VI. And the good news is you can visit this castle. It is open seasonally to the public. And I was fortunate to visit it a couple of years ago. And the castle is reputedly very, very haunted with at least six ghosts associated with it, including an apparition in the crypt, the audible cursing and occasional wandering of the dark Earl Beardy, who gambled away, it is said, his soul to the devil. There's also a grey lady in the chapel, which is believed to be Janet Douglas, who was burned at the stake uh, on the 17th of July, 1537, on the false charge of witchcraft. And then, of course, there is one of the darkest legends in Scottish history, that of the monster of Glams, who some believe may have been a vampire, or certainly something terrible enough to be kept locked up within the castle walls. Now, they do say that at Glams, there are more windows on the outside than on the inside. And if you actually look at the rear of the castle, there is one that's bricked up and they think that could be the secret room in which the monster of Glams is contained. So do we know um, how many extra um, uh, windows there may be? Is there ever count? I mean, are we took one, or is there like ten? And there's, there's there's quite a few windows there. I I don't have those numbers to hand, but I think people have done it, and they apparently they used to go around hanging sheets out of all the windows <laughs> to ascertain where where the one was. But if you do look at the rear of the castle, um, you can actually sort of make out roughly where it is. I mean, it sounds a little bit like a uh, Jonathan Creek episode when mm. uh, there was secret room and secret compartments. Uh, another mystery. If I always it's, it's um, always worth going to have a look just to do the to do the count, um, mm. but I guess you'd need a lot of access to a lot of rooms, which probably public wouldn't be allowed to do. Um, but no, that's like, I'd love to do that. It'd be a lot of fun. So, what would be our number four, three? Sorry, three. If I was three. <laughs> what would be number three in the in the list? Well, three. We're going to um, one of royalty's homes. It's none other than Windsor Castle. Mm. Oh, now, this wow. came to being home to several phantoms. And the ghosts are said, naturally, to have royal connections. We're talking Elizabeth I, dressed in black, walking the library and the castle walls. There's Charles I, who appears in the canon's house. George III has been witnessed in a room where he spent the remainder of his life in debilitating madness. And then, of course, there's the apparition of King Henry VIII. He's allegedly been sighted in the corridors and the sounds of his dragging leg and that of a lame man accompanied by groans have been heard in the cloisters. Now, these have been attributed to him as well, even though nothing has been seen. It's still nice to think that it could be Henry VIII wandering around. Now, a group of men were sighted in 1906 by an on-duty sentry who shot and then charged at the group 
with his fixed bayonet, only for the group to vanish. So if ever you uh, decided to check out Windsor Castle, the chances are you could well see something because of the number of ghosts that are there. Mm. Um, again, it's, 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 it's a location with so much history um, uh, that you can understand why, to begin with, it would be so active. But you do, I suppose, wonder why um, it's after you know a good hundred years of royal patronage, you consider a slightly more peaceful time that it maybe those ghosts have been sort of encouraged to like back off royalty and presence, unless they're vindictive, in which case they might go, "You're you're an um, an ancestor of someone." Um, and then maybe they just want to have a go at someone. Pat suggested, um, have we been to Vivi, would you say, Castle? Or Vivi, Dantar? isn't it? Um, no. Is, is Dunatar just outside of Aberdeen? I think it might be, actually, yeah. yeah. That's the one that's right on the coast, isn't it? Um, no, I haven't been to either. I do have a list, a long list of places that I really need to go and see. Um, and I, I do love Scotland so much. Um, and if I have a list of castles specifically in Scotland, I do want to go and visit. And Dunatar is actually one of them that's on that list. Great. So we're getting to that crucial moment now for the last two castles. Um, what are you going to put as number two? Well, for me, number two, we have touched on it already. Uh, it's Dover Castle in Kent. Now, this is known as the key to England. It's a magnificent fortress at Dover has played you know, a crucial role in the defence of the realm for over nine centuries, a span equaled only by one other castle, uh, by the Tower of London and Windsor Castle. And it was founded in the 11th century. Now, Dover is a scheduled monument. It's a grade one listed building. It's under the care of English heritage and is a major tourist attraction. Uh, and you can see why just from this picture alone, it is incredible to look at. It's reputedly one of the most haunted castles in Great Britain. And a number of apparitions are said to have been sighted here, including the famous headless drummer boy, who was said to have been murdered during the Napoleonic Wars, now wanders the battlements. It was said that he was carrying money from one part of the castle to another, and he was set upon, robbed, and his body thrown from the castle walls. And we did mention different uh, apparitions of women of different colours, grey ladies, black ladies, white ladies. This one has the woman in red, and she walks the keep. You can see right in the middle of that shot. There's a cavalier being sighted in the grounds. And interestingly, World War II phantoms have been reported in the underground tunnels, which are another incredible part of this castle to visit. Now, audible phenomena in these tunnels include screams, cries, whispering voices. And interestingly, a few years ago, apparently some American tourists um, commended the castle on the realistic uh, audio that was uh, heard in the uh, underground tunnels. Uh, which English Heritage then informed them that they don't have any in the tunnels at all. So what did these tourists hear? Was it something paranormal? Could well have been. And there have also been some other interesting things like doors and um, opening and closing of their own accord and some significant temperature drops reported in parts of the castle as well. Excellent. I mean, it is a spectacular castle in terms of its space. Um, and if anyone's ever visited, um, you'll know it's... It's, it's an enormous place, absolutely enormous. And again, you've got the variety of different locations within it. There's all sorts of different structures of buildings. There's, for me, it's a little, oh, I get troubled by arguing, but a little bit like Edinburgh in terms of it's been there for such a long time, but then developed several times by several generations and always been so important in terms of defence. So that's why it's been a lot of time and energy and money spent on these things. Because at the end of the day, most of these castles come down to money. And if the, the prevailing government don't prepare to spend money on them, then uh, they don't. But then sometimes they think, well, you know, I mean, you've got, you've, a great builder. You've got to look at that and go, my God, the amount of work that's gone into designing something like that and building of that and the labour involved. And it's just absolutely breathtaking. Totally. 
yeah, the scale of the, the place is incredibly yeah. impressive. Uh, and if you are going to visit, you know, I would say that a day, it probably isn't enough to cover all the parts of it. It really does cover a huge area. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. In fact, it's on my list of places to go and investigate next year, so I'm quite excited. Um, a lot of tunnels to look through. I like mm. like dark tunnels. Um, so the moment we've been waiting for, what would you consider to be the most haunted castle up and down this great realm? Well, it was a tough choice, but this one, I think, is, is the pinnacle, and it's the place I would love to spend days weeks exploring if only i could it is of course the tower of london now this was founded towards the end of 1066 as part of the norman conquest of england and william the conqueror built the white tower uh, which gives the entire castle its name in set in 1078 and the castle has been a grand palace and a royal residence and was used as a prison from 1100 until get this 1952 although that was not its primary purpose. As a whole, the tower is a complex of several buildings set within two concentric rings of defensive walls and a moat. And this has got lots and lots of history associated with it. And of course, as you'd expect, lots of ghosts. And if you believe um, there's a connection between acts of violence and hauntings, then this is of little surprise. Theories aside, the tower is haunted by the likes of Henry VI in the Wakefield Tower. There's a white lady in the White Tower. Two children dressed in nightgowns have been sighted in the Bloody Tower, and these are believed to be none other than lost princes in the tower connected to King Richard III. The wraiths of Anne Boleyn, Lady Jane Grey and Margaret Powell haunt Tower Green. Now, the ghost of Margaret Powell is, I think, one of the saddest. She was executed on Tower Green, and it's said that the axeman had to chase her around the Tower Green, taking swings at her neck before actually killing her. There's also the smell of cheap perfume around the entrance to St John's Chapel, and there's quite a few other odd incidents have been reported by staff, beef eaters, and visitors to the castle over the many years that it's been open. That why is gets my number one position. Wow. I mean, is this a location that you have visited, obviously, during the day, as a, as a, as a, as a yeah. member of the public, but have you ever got to see any of the uh, areas behind the scenes? I haven't, unfortunately. I mean, I've visited the normal areas where you would expect. Um, however, my uncle, um, now, but my day job is I'm an operations manager for a security firm that specialises in television security for outside broadcasts. So we do tend to go to places where the public don't get access to, to look after TV, trucks and equipment. And he has actually been locked in, in his motorhome, in the Tower of London. And he actually got to see the changing of the keys and those kinds of things to see that a lot of people don't actually ever get to. So I've always said, if another outside broadcast comes up, at the Tower of London that requires me to be <laughs> locked in overnight, it's mine. I'm going Excellent. to that one. I think I would as well. Um, because mm. again, the history, the history is just dripping with heritage and the names associated, all these names that we learn through history and we see on TV and movies and films, and they experience these things, lived there and all, of course, died there in that in, in that amazing location. So it's one of those places where you just think it's it's so laden with the importance of history that um, you can't help but feel you'd, you'd go there. But essentially, when I do ghost walks up and down uh, the country uh, telling stories, there's very often uh, scenes, uh, places of execution or um, fiercely dramatic moments of history have occurred, that whereas the location has now changed completely um, and you don't even know it's there. So modern day uh, people walking over the area of, of an execution site or uh, uh, cells that have been converted into modern shops, you don't see any of it. Um, and there's something about the Taiwan because it's been there for so long, it's carved itself in history and therefore you gravitate towards it uh, because of because of that heritage. And yet probably everywhere we go up and down the country, and there are town centres, significant bits of, of, of you know, dreadful <laughs> history that we, we associate with the town of London, but they've just been eradicated. So we don't see them anymore or don't even know about them anymore. So um, in terms of all the places we've been to, um, what 
would you say could possibly top the Tower of London? Have you been to a location where you've been quite astounded by the amount of potential activity that's been reported or even better, whether you have experienced? That one castle for me, and it stems back to my childhood, that there are two castles near to where I grew up in South Wales. The first, I, I grew up in Newport. Um, there's Newport Castle, which, you know, it, there's not a lot left of it, but that was the first haunted castle that I actually knew about. And it sits on the banks of the River Esk in Newport. And it's completely haunted by the ghost of Robert uh, Fitzsimmons, who built the castle. Um, but it's the one just outside... Um, outside Newport at a place called Caldecott, um, which does have a sort of special place in me because when I was a teenager, I used to spend a lot of my time going up to that castle. I'd take my equipment that I, I gathered meticulously having based on Peter Underwood's list in The Ghost Hunter's Guide. And I would go up to the castle and spend as many days as I could during the school holidays just at the castle. And the castles were great. They, they would let me you know, turn up there and sit and wait and watch during the day. And the one day I did actually have an experience there in one of the towers. And I was speaking to the park ranger who had been working there for a number of years. And we were sat in his office and I was asking him about some of the things that had gone on in the castle. And as we were sat there talking about one of the apparitions that were sighted in the castle, but bearing in mind this was um, of an afternoon, Midsummer, it was, it was you know, a reasonably warm day. In the confines of the, the office that we were in, because we were in a stone building, he'd put his electric fire on just to give the room a bit of warmth. And there was a thermometer on the table, we were discussing about the different kinds of phenomena, when the whole room went incredibly freezing cold as we were talking about this particular sighting. And we both watched the thermometer drop 11 degrees, literally like that. And then gradually, wow. the temperature on the thermometer rose back up to the level it had been before we were to actually started talking about this particular apparition sighting. And all the while, don't forget, the electric fire was on in the room. So that, that experience has always stayed with me. And that's probably one of the strangest things that I've ever encountered. Um, but that was going back to when I was about 16 years old, so ne nearly 30 years ago. I mean, if anyone has ever done uh, ghost hunting and you have looked at temperature fluctuations, you know you can get a, a couple of degrees, obviously throughout the night the temperature drops anyway, and it, it can easily drop overnight 10 degrees, um, but a rapid temperature drop of that degree is very, very unusual indeed. Mm -hmm. So um, that was quite impressive. Would you say that the more places you have investigated, how can I word this? Let's just say the, the least amount of activity impresses you. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm one of these investigators that, that goes, I, I try to do quality rather than quantity. So I would rather spend a lot of time in one location rather than visiting lots and saying, oh, I've investigated this, I've investigated this and ticking off a list because that's not investigation. Investigation is spending a significant amount of time going through a correct process to get to some answers. Um, whether or not there's a place where, where nothing has happened that's impressive, I um, can't really answer that. Because I think a lot of the things tend to be quite subtle anyway. Because I... I think what I've in, encountered is that um, as I've done more and more ghost hunts, that, that you sort of uh, a very, because I realised that we said your best experience was 16 years, uh, when you, sorry, when you were 16. And I would say that when I first started doing this, I had some very extraordinary encounters. And I would probably say gradually they've become, not necessarily less, but just less exciting, less, um, wow, that was amazing. You sort of, maybe just become a little bit blasé. So you get a temperature drop, but it's not as good as the temperature drop we had before. Um, mm -hmm. And maybe you sort of just go, mm, yeah, it's not as good as the last one. So maybe you sort of gradually are less and less impressed each time. But I don't know what anybody else feels, whether they, the more you ever investigate locations or research locations that you actually feel there's less happening. Lara, in terms of what you've done, would you say that you've, uh, felt like there's been uh, um, 
less activity or rather less uh, you've been less impressed with activity than when you were quite you know when you first started your your sort of journey well absolutely I think it's <laughs> Get a bit of feedback so can read it. Oh, say that again. Did you get a bit of feedback there? Did you? Just a little bit, yes. Yeah, I think um, less impressed. Less impressed. I think it's more to do with the fact that when you first discover it, of course, you're all it's like the sweet shop syndrome, isn't it? You're like, oh my god, you know. And then the more you want to see, the more are you, is your mind sort of putting together to actually see. I think I prefer to go by how I feel in a place. So, and, and Jonathan, I sent a picture by Laura um, that was on the chat as well about the green lady. It's in the chat column anyway. You know of you know the one behind the scenes that we do. So you can never be look at that. I tend to find as a medium as well. Oh, there it is. Thank you. So I stuck it up, but because I have no time to process it, it sort of rather has <laughs> just blocked you out. So if you stick and your I hands out to side, we'll, <laughs> you'll spit your... There we go. <laughs> <laughs> Great effect. Um, so I don't... So is that the green lady? That's apparently the green lady. I've asked Laura which castle it's at, but she hasn't actually got back to me because she had an appointment. But I thought I forwarded it on to you because I thought, yeah, you can see it. You can see her, can't you? Now, I can see a shadow, and it's got and it's been formed by. Is it the tiny thing at the bottom? There's something tiny that's only um, like a centimeter tall on my screen. Well, I, no, she's well, she's quite. She's quite tall. I can see her in, like, you've got the tree, and then you, you know where the window is. Oh, you, you, she's that tall. I, I, I thought that was just the shadow. Yeah, to me, that is straight away I homed in on that. I can't see anything else in the picture other than that. To, well, to me, but again, I'm getting a screen reflection, that if you take the corner of the window and there's a sort of diagonal line, if you follow that di diagonal line down, there's a tiny little different shade green thing. Yeah, That's yeah. <laughs> Ah, but then you can you can see at the bottom, can't you? That um, I don't know. That to me, the tree. I wasn't even questioning how tall the tree was. I'm thinking. I'm taking a picture of because all of us are like going. Yeah, I know we're right up at the. <laughs> Dylan, what did you see in the picture? Um, I'm notorious when it comes to viewing pictures. I, I tend to put my police head back on and look at what evidence we've actually got, and before making a judgment, I would like to see you know find out what camera it was taken on. Um, you know, let's get the data from the actual file of the photograph. Um, first impressions, I, I don't see anything. Um, so we'd have to consider whether things like pareidolia and things like that could be could be responsible for it. I'll I'll push it up again. Um, if you if anyone wants to peer at that picture a little bit longer, um, it's a shame I haven't got time to blow it up. Um, I might try and process it in the future and see whether. Because we can't even agree what we're looking at, let alone what we what we think the phenomena is in terms of. See, and didn't actually take a look. Oh, I'm see All right, I'm seeing something else now. Actually, I'm seeing a taller gray figure, green figure. Man, right? And when we look at something, it's learning not to see it with your eyes, but seeing it with your mind's eye, right? And that requires a different um, processing thing in the brain. All right. Whereas we're, we're a society conditioned to, like Dylan was saying, you've got to see what cameras, but cameras will only, it's to do with it's pixelate, it's to do with the amount of, um, what does it do with per, per screenshot? So we can only go as far as that camera is capable of photographing on a, on, a, on a certain vibrational level of formation of what that object's meant to look like. Right. So it's like anything when you look at it, to look at anything that's supernatural, we have to have supernatural apparatus. We can't see it with a normal apparatus, not even in our mind, unless we actually condition or, or allow our mind to look at something in a freedom based way rather than a let's drag everything in of things that we know in a logical way. We're not going to see stuff like that. We're just not. That's why I like that. Pardon? I was going to say to John that if you want to see something, I've actually sent you a picture of the bar. <laughs> yes, I yes, I was coming. To, I was coming. I was coming to that. I was. I would just say though, go on, Laura. I'm going to go off on a tangent. I would like to discuss the whole Ghostbusters thing, right? I would oh. <laughs> not just yeah. the bar. I'm a big, huge fan of Ghostbusters, and you pull. The, you've got the mug. You've got the Ghostbusters bar out there. You've done the Ghostbusters tour over in America as well. I'm like, oh my god, we need to talk about this. Right. While while you're talking about that, I'll put this picture up. Oh, who are you going to call? Dylan Jones. 
That's what you're going to do when it comes to the bar. <laughs> That's incredible, Dylan. Thank you. I, 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 that was a bit of a project during lockdown. I said to my wife, oh, should we, should we you know, build a bar for the garden? The grandkids absolutely love it. Obviously, they don't get the alcohol, they get the soft drinks. But, you know, it was, it was, it was a bit of fun. It lights up as well. There's lots of lights in there and glows green at night. So, it's, yeah, I'm quite proud of it. Yeah, you should be proud of that. So how long did it take you to manifest that and to, to work on that and to, like, was it a week, two weeks? You said during lockdown. Lockdown was, what, about three months, wasn't it? Did it take the full, the full time? No, it, the, the idea actually occurred to me about um, halfway through lockdown and I sort of kicked the idea around for a couple of weeks, sketched things out and drew a few plans and then it took me about actually two weeks to build it. Wow, I can see a live streaming thing happening from there, Dylan. <laughs> live yeah. streaming from the bar, yes. Live streaming from the bar, and you could talk about the ghost tours from that bar. Incredible. Come round. Once lockdown is fully Bobby. over, no problem. Well, let's do, let's do, we can do a live stream first, and then and then from each other's bars, and then. So, Lara, have you got a bar? No, well, the bar here, right, is a classy thing, right? The bar's actually <laughs> hidden, but I could go in the bar, I suppose, and, and do it from there. You'll see when you come up, Jonathan, there used to be one in the breakfast room, but the Danish guy that used to own it years ago, very flamboyant guy, ripped it out. I mean, it's a The bar service was table service, if you know what I mean. It was that high class. You didn't see a bar on the outside. It's always, oh, you know, right. a hidden room. Yeah. It's just that I've now got a bar downstairs, Um um, so I think we could do all <laughs> from all our bars. Good. We'll that, yeah, yeah, I would be country bar fest. I would look like I was in a cupboard, Jonathan. <laughs> like Harry Potter, right? Ben will be he'll be laughing his head off if I suggested let's film from the bar. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us about the Ghostbuster side of things. Did you, you know, when you saw the films, Dylan, right? And because obviously this inspiration has gone with you through life hasn't it? If you're now creating the bar in your garden, right? This has been a huge influence on you. Would you say the Ghostbusters has influenced you also with um, doing the ghost tours? Um, the Ghostbusters thing, actually, I, what got me into the paranormal was an experience I had when I was about seven. Um, when I woke up uh, one night and thought I saw the apparition of my uncle who had died the year before um, standing in my room. But that could have been a hypnopopic experience where I just woke up from a dream state. The following uh, the year then, um, in 1980, late 1984, early 85, I went to see, because I badgered my mum for weeks to say, take me to see this film called Ghostbusters, and that was it. I was hooked. I wanted to know, as a result of that, what other people's experiences were. And then it really rolled on from that. So my interest in the paranormal comes from a possible paranormal experience and a media experience, and that today has led me to um, the PhD that I've started looking at the media influences of the paranormal and people who research it and that's influence then upon people who then go ghost hunting and investigating the paranormal. So for me Ghostbusters is a, is a couple of things, it's about the fun, it's about the comedy, it's a great film but it also influenced me quite a lot to get into the, the subject in the first place and I see a lot of Ghostbusters in a lot of the investigative groups today. You know, they've yeah. got the YouTube they, they wave their little gadgets around. It, like, it looks like they're doing science. Um, they respond to things quickly. It, it, it's got those little elements to it, which are there's little nods for me there. Um, but I'm really interested in finding out whether or not the media really does affect investigators in a whole other range of things as well. Well, just to, because I want to carry on with that for a couple of minutes, but um, Laura has said it's Tullock Castle up north in Dingwall. Very haunted. We stayed for three nights and got no sleep. Okay, so that's, you know, the picture of the green lady. It's Dingwall. Anyway, Tullock Castle. Getting back to the Ghostbusters thing, right? So you could arguably say that Ghostbusters influenced a revolution, really. It's a movement, isn't it? And you can see it present Jonathan does ghost busting, right? You go and do the ghost haunting. You've got to have, a, I can see the little smi ironic smile, you know, with you because you can see the correlation with that. And it's the well, same. I'd like, to, I'd like yeah. to argue that I wasn't hapless and covered in slime. No, but there's always <laughs> part of you that goes, maybe one day that will happen. 
Right. And I tell you what, we've got the ecto bar now. Can we just say that? So if we pay Dylan a visit, there's every possibility that we could end up being covered in slime down there. <laughs> <laughs> but I think I think most Ghostbusters would like the idea of the, the backpack and, and the plasma beam. Um, I think and then the trap, the idea you just roll out this trap and capture a ghost, I think would be very exciting. That's right. And then we could take it home and sit and look at it when we're having our tea. <laughs> Woo! Yeah, <laughs> no, seriously, the Ghostbusters thing. I've got to say, like you, I think I was fifteen when the ghost, the original Ghostbusters film came out, mm. and that was it. I was like the whole, you know, I was into seances at the time and started doing seances, and that film came out, and of course the, you know, making the connection of both. And further down the line, you know, we've had Most Haunted, and say what you like about it, you know, that that kind of, you know, TV coverage actually inspired a nation didn't it to get it made it more friendly sociably friendly i think it made it more um as a kind of thing that we could study i mean today you said you're doing a phd in and is it parapsychology what is it you're doing a phd in it's it's a parapsychology related area so i'm looking at uh, the media representation of paranormal phenomena and the researchers so I'm looking at things like ghostbusters how it was treated in poltergeist how it's treated in paranormal reality television shows, um, and then how that influences people, or if it does, when they actually go ghost hunting. So does it affect the way that they do things when they're out in a field study? Does it affect their practices? Does it affect their professionalism? Um, so it, there's a whole lot of things that I'm looking at, but I'm literally at the start of the journey. I started it in March. I'm doing it part time over six years. So there's a long way to go yet. But at the moment, it's it's a huge amount of reading and, and writing. Well, that's right. And and actually, it, the, the whole concept of you've got the Ghostbusters thing. I started doing a parapsychology PhD, but I had to go. It was an American thing. They had to send it over to me way back mm. then. We're very nowadays we can and it's only a fairly recent thing that we can actually do you know our qualification really in parapsychology really in in the uk and so look how far we've come but it's also a sign of you've got the ghostbuster thing of i suppose entertaining the idea of that and then you've got the tv aspect of it because you know obviously you're from the tv side as well and actually what you can do in order to make it look attractive on TV or to be interesting on TV and the two are very different and with that same concept now look at how we try and analyze pictures of ghosts yeah. so we've got the the idea we've got the experience we've got the feeling we've got people seeing them but to capture it on film to capture it in picture on a TV form can be an entirely different thing altogether would you agree Dylan yeah I mean, there's a lot there's certainly a lot to go on there one of the things I'm, I'm concerned about is um the sort of academic side of parapsychology and, and where these people are getting degrees from. I'm currently co-authoring a, a paper with Steve Parsons and uh, Cal Cooper uh, we're looking at how parapsychology being people passing themselves off as parapsychologists, um, which is an area of concern. Ah, right. OK, then. Yeah, well, there you go. And uh, as a medium, right, I feel like that when it comes to people trying to get evidence of what we're actually picking up and interpreting it. And we, we, you know, even in our industry, you get charlatans all the time, right? It's not just an area that you can just go gung-ho into. There's a lot to take on board. There's a lot. It's a very complex area. And probably in our lifetime, we're never going to get to the bottom of it, are we, Dylan? Nope. Probably not, if ever. What the fascination is probably all about. There you go. <laughs> We've had a message from Pam, who is finishing her PhD and wants to do a dissertation about something paranormal. So she's asking if you want a partner, contact her. Uh, she's a PhD wow. in psychology. There you go. You get offers there, already. Look at you, delegate offers from women already. There we go. <laughs> I'm telling you, it's the Ghostbuster bar. That it's might be it. <laughs> yeah. Everybody can come around. It'd be fine. I think it's just an open day and we'll all just pile in. Definitely. So um, I think we definitely need to plan a future live from uh, Dylan's bar, the Ecto bar. The Ecto bar, I could have the, the posh bar and what could your bar be called? Because you've got a bar as well, couldn't we? Um, mine's a gin bar. It's called oh, a blue bar. 
Oh my God, Jonathan, when you're up here, we've got some gin distilleries up here. You'll love it. Oh, okay. <laughs> and Pam's pointing out, Pam has just like to clarify, this is purely scientific interest in the, in terms of any kind of collaboration. Can we just make that totally clear? <laughs> of course. We were just teasing. Just to clarify that. Well, that's um, like so, thank you so much for compiling the top 10 uh, most haunted castles of uh, the United Kingdom. Uh, we must do something from Ireland. There's plenty of those I'm sure we could include. Um, so, uh, fascinating subject. Thank you so much for coming on. Um, next week, we will be talking about en enchanted or other haunted uh, forests and woods. So if anyone's ever had any experiences in woods of a paranormal, whether it be ghosts or UFO sightings, because uh, that can very often happen in the woods, um, or whether you've seen any kind of sprites or fairies, then we want to hear from you because we're going to be delving into that. In fact, Nori and I were filming at Clapham Woods last night. So we were traipsing around the woods in darkness. Um, it was very entertaining. So we will be showing some of that video probably next week. Wait, the, 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 even the word clap, doesn't it? It's nowhere near London either, because you, it's not, you think it's near a railway station, it's not, it's in uh, West Sussex. Wow, can't wait for that. Dylan, I've got to say, I found your 10 top um, haunted castles absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much for coming in and showing us. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's been an absolute pleasure. So if anything, anything again, just let me know. More than happy to help. Okay. Well, I think we're going to start compiling some stories and we're going to get people to tell us about their experiences of right across the country. Yep, that would be a great idea. I think it'll be, it'll be massively fascinating. So we'll, we'd love to have you back at some point, Dylan. You take care and happy barring. <laughs> 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 Who are you going to call? I think it's got to be Dylan Thomas with the Great British Gold, <laughs> honestly. Because that, that guy, you've got some serious moves. Take care anyway, Dylan. So bye -bye. thank you very much, everyone. That's the end of the show. Tune in next week and we'll be talking about haunted woods. So have a good week and we'll catch you again on Let's Talk. Take care, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye.